morning, everybody, and uh, again, thanks to the tourist board for asking me um, to come. Uh, for some reason, I'm uh, allegedly an authority <laughs> in, in this discipline. Uh, please don't tell anybody. Um, Niall, you're a hard act to follow, but I'm going to try my best. Um, as Mark said there, I um, have been working with hotels, working in the travel industry for a long time, um, working with hotels since 1998 when I um, started working with Hilton. Um, got, gone through sales and then into revenue and really then find a discipline that I really enjoyed in revenue. I was lucky enough to work for a company in London um, who taught me the mechanics of revenue um, and how to set rates, how to manage um, rates. And during that time, um, I was approached by several smaller hotels who really couldn't afford the, the big glamorous software that told them how to set the rates and did all the um, number crunching um, for them. Um, so about six and, yeah, nearly seven years ago, I decided to go out on my own. And um, now I work with smaller hotels, independent hotels. Basically, my remit with them is to try and make them more money. Um, and to do that is to understand their rates, understand their customers. So when Niall helps you get the customers to your website, my job then is to help with the booking engine and uh, convert online as well. So what is revenue management? Well, revenue management is the practice that helps you sell the right product to the right person at the right time, at the right price, and for the right duration. And it's all about trying to add money to your bottom line. Oh, is this going to work? You have to be very uh, overawed by this because this took me ages and ages to do. <laughs> <laughs> and the first slide didn't work, so kinda, it's kind of lost the momentum. Basically, um, we all arrived at the Ross Park today, okay? And the car park is very generous, thank you. But we all had a decision on where to park today. Now, do you do like I do and take the first uh, spot that I don't actually have to reverse into because I'm a girl? Or do you try and get close to the door? Um, well, there's things that influence that decision. First of all, if you can parallel park and reverse, which I can't. Or, for example, if it's raining. So if it's raining, obviously, we try and get close to the door. Um, this is not going to work. Yay! <laughs> Yay, it worked! <laughs> or do we take the risk, OK, and try and get close? But what happens if we all arrived at the same time? The car park's busy. What do we do? Do we take this, like me, and play safe and get wet? Or do we risk? this happening, okay? Do we actually risk trying to get a bit closer? That's me with the angry face. And that's what revenue management is all about. It's do we actually play it safe and put some low rates out there and allow people to book our rates at, at, um, at a market value, or do we hold out and push for higher rates? And it's all about assessing that rate. I'm not here today to tell you that Everybody needs to sell at top rates all the time. I'm not here to tell you that you need to drop your rates and, and flood the market. It's trying to get a little understanding of when you need to do both. Okay, to give you a little bit of a history on, on the background of revenue management, um, as you probably all are aware, it started in the airline industry. And up until about 1978, basically the airline sat around this virtual table and said, the cheapest price we're going to sell to New York is this, the most expensive price is this, and as long as we're selling somewhere in between, that's fine. Not price cartelling, but certainly there was a, a minimum and a, and a maximum price. In 1978, the Deregulation Act happened, and if any of you are as old as I am, you'll probably remember Freddie Laker. And uh, Laker Airlines was the first bucket shop airline to come on and was selling cheap fares across the States. Well, that resulted in profit wars, obviously, but what happened then was it was actually American Airlines with the first airline, and they started to analyze customer behavior. And what they realized was that not everybody wanted these cheap flights because they came with restrictions. Not everybody could book three weeks in advance or stay a Saturday night. Somebody maybe wanted to fly into New York and out of Boston. So those cheap flights didn't suit everyone, and it's exactly the same in the hotel industry. 
cheap rooms don't suit everyone, okay? So American Airlines started to, they brought in the mathematicians and they started to do the number crunching. And that's when the first revenue systems were born. And then it filtered, the next industry really was hotels. It's then filtered down to car hire, TV advertising, new, you know, all of those things. Um, now, boat companies, it's all about supply and demand. But we have the airlines to thank for that. So does an accommodation provider or a hotel actually qualify to be able to manage rates? Well, yes, because you have fixed capacity. You have only a certain number of rooms, okay? Um, you have a perishable product. If you don't sell your rooms tonight, you can't, it's not a Mars bar, you can't put it back on the shelf and resell those rooms tomorrow night. You've lost your opportunity if you haven't sold. You have varying demand. July will be, diff uh, sorry, demand in July will be different to January. Sundays will be di different to Saturdays. You have multiple pricing. You potentially will have uh, cheaper rates for tour operators, maybe more expensive rates for weddings. And most importantly, you have a reservation process. The, res the res reservation process is so important because that is the time when you can actually influence someone's decision to buy and the price that they pay, okay? So we're gonna have a look at that in a little more detail. So why change your rate strategy at all? Um, when I started on my own six, seven years ago, um, a couple of the hotels said to me, you know, Adrian, you know, we've, we, our, our customers are used to seeing a price. We have a, a low season price, we have a high season price, and we've got to tell them something. You know, we've got brochures printed, we've got to tell them something. They've got to understand what rate to pay. Well, yes, I get that. But the word from is a great, um, a great word to use. And if you're not using it in your pricing, I would suggest that you start. But if we think about this, if you have, let's say your low season is from the 1st of October to the 31st of March. And you have actually a tariff, which I hate on your websites, or a brochure printed, and it says your low season rates. Let's say you get a group in or a wedding in, or let's be honest, we wouldn't be in business if we were all dead during the winter. So you have busy days, you have spikes in demand during the winter, even though it is your low season. Why on earth would you cap your rates at 50 pounds, for example, in low season, if you have the opportunity to sell higher? The flip side of that, though, is you advertise your high season rates from the 1st of April, let's say, to the 30th of September. With the best will in the world, none of us are selling at 100% occupancy for all of those days in the summer. So if I pick up a brochure of yours and you say, as shows me in the summer that you're selling at £100 for a given night, potentially it's out of my price range. You might be sitting with two rooms on the books, two rooms sold, but you have told me that your price is £100. I am not potentially going to even call you or check out your website. You're too expensive. So why are you capping your rates either too high or too low? I have changed rate strategies in 20, 30 plus hotels now. And everyone asks me the same question at the start. Is this going to affect our business? How on earth can we change the rates that we're selling? Well, the answer is we do. And not once in those seven years has it been a problem. Not once, okay? Um, this presentation today, when I deliver revenue training, even at this level, it normally takes me two days. <laughs> so I've been asked to do it in about 25 minutes, so I'm going to just give you the headlines and I hope maybe some disciplines today that will make you think, if not maybe apply to your own business. So let's have a look. I just want to give you an example. We have, let's say, a and b or um, a, a mid-scale hotel. And, and this is an actual example, okay? I had someone in their summer season was selling advertising at 100 pounds a night. Even on a good day, 40 rooms at 100 pounds a night, if he was filling, 4,000 pounds. Please excuse the figures, it's a simplified version, but it's just to give you an idea. What we looked at, though, was um, he was expecting everyone that coming into his property 
to pay exactly the same price. That's not the case. We have, by the very nature of hotels, people who will bargain shop, and we'll talk about that more in a second, and people who are actually prepared to pay more. So what if we look at then changing our pricing strategy and letting some people book early, pay a little bit less, and then as the demand increases, we actually start to increase our pricing. What happens? We actually make more money. We are setting our pricing in line with our market. We then need to look at our own prices internally. And again, we'll go into this in more detail in a second. But internally, um, pricing, um, it's called price elasticity. You have to understand your pricing points and what your customers perceive as value. So for example, I have one hotel, and we did all the, the number crunching on it. We changed a particular package that they had, their most popular package. Um, we knew the lead-in time, we knew the demand, we understood that because we tracked it from last year, and we, we knew that package inside out. We knew who bought it, when it was bought, and we decided we'd do a little experiment and we increased the price by 20 points. What happened? Absolutely nothing. There was no change in demand. The hotel, I had a feeling that the hotel were actually selling too cheap and that if we moved that package price by a little, it wouldn't affect the demand. And that's what happened. They were able to change the pricing and move that package up a level. If, however, we had moved it by 40 pounds, the pickup absolutely would have changed and it would have been too expensive for the market. Now, you're able to do that, and this is where you need to look at your own business. You're able to do that if you are a hotel that has a unique, or a, a, an accommodation provider that has a unique product, or you're operating in a market that allows you to change your pricing. Let's say that you were a three-star hotel in the city centre. If you, you maybe have Ramada Encore, Park Plaza, you know, you've got those three star brands all around you, potentially within half a mile radius. If I was working for any of those hotels and changed their pricing by five pounds, the demand would walk out the door. It would move to another competitor. So you need to understand who is in your marketplace and what your price points are. Do you actually have the capacity to change your rates? Are you offering something unique in the marketplace that will allow you to change your pricing or not? So, first step, when I go into a hotel, I normally spend two days doing an audit. And it actually shocks me sometimes that hotels don't actually understand their business. Without a doubt, I could say to most hotels, what's your business? And they'll say 70% corporate, 30% leisure, or the other way around. But when you start actually analysing the data, you'll find something actually quite different. So before I even start putting a rate strategy in hotels, we have to understand someone's business. So for example, are you a business property? Is it mainly corporate that you have? Weddings? Do you have sports groups? Um, romantic weekends? Is it families? Tour bus? maybe the um, older uh, seniors, or maybe adventure-type um, hotels. The reason we need to find that out is that all of these people book at different times and have different needs. So, for example, your tour bus. We all know they book two years in advance. They're looking for really cheap uh, rates, and a hotel should use them predominantly as base business. Um, your weddings, book probably a year in advance. Um, your families, they maybe have to fit in with school holidays or husband, wife's diary. Um, your elderly people, your older people, maybe are more flexible. Um, we could maybe start capturing that business midweek. Um, and your businessmen, we all love them because they book within three days. That's their booking window, it's three to three days to day of arrival. All of these people will book at different times, they all have different needs, and they all have different price points. 
And the other thing is you can't be all things to all people, okay? So understand your business, who you're trying to get in through the door, what market you're trying to attract, and then let's set your rates around that. So when you're starting to look at your rates, how, what do you do? How do you set them? Well, there's three ways. You look at your competitors, okay? That gives you a benchmark of what similar hotels are doing. Now, don't particularly just look at your hotels um, in, the, in the immediate area. So for example, if I was asked to set a rate strategy within this hotel, I wouldn't necessarily just be looking at hotels in um, Ballymena. I would be looking at, you know, this hotel probably attracts, and I'm guessing this hotel probably attracts a lot of people coming away for the weekend, couples coming away. Um, so the competitive set, I see you sitting in the audience, so I'm going to use you. Your competitive set could be Le Mans. Um, so that kind of hotel that would be a lovely country, um, nice weekend way. So your competitive set isn't necessarily just people within a three mile radius. The other thing is, don't set your rates just based on what your competitors are doing. Because your competitor, nine times out of ten, is an idiot and has no idea what they're doing anyway. So t just take it into consideration, but don't let your competitor determine your rates. So we've got competitive pricing, demand pricing, and that's basically hotels who use what business they have on the books. When, when, when do they feel they're going to be busy and when, when do they feel they're going to be less busy? Or reference pricing. Now, if I said to any of you, I'm staying in the merchant tonight, already you've calculated roughly in your head what you think I'm going to pay. If I said to you I was staying in the travel lodge tonight, again, you'd all have a perception of what I had paid for that service. So we all have a, um, our customers have a perception of our pricing. And that's where exactly what Niall said, it's not what you want to sell to a customer, it's what a customer perceives you are worth. I have one hotel that remain, will remain nameless, but that over prices themselves. They think they are the best hotel in Ireland. They're not. And they over price themselves and they price themselves out of the market a lot of the time. So you have to be careful. <coughs> it's what your customers actually want to pay. Could be what they've maybe seen on the internet, what they've paid before, or if they're a new visitor, let's say to Belfast, and they're looking for four-star hotels, if they're looking at half a dozen four-star hotels online and you're sitting way above everybody else, you've, you've priced yourself out of the game. This is actually taken from uh, a hotel that I work with and it's their rate, so this is a live scenario. Um, so we need to take some first steps. So what are the first steps? Well, the little picture of a fence up there that I nicked from Google clip art or images or whatever. Um, it's basically, we need to rate fence. We need to fence people off. And people by their very nature will actually segment themselves or fence themselves off naturally. So for example, do you have rooms with a sea view or a courtyard view? Do you have standard rooms, deluxe rooms? Can you fence people off by offering dinner, bed and breakfast or just bed and breakfast? Um, there's lots of ways to segment um, customers. For example, packages. Um, if you uh, design a package, you could actually put additional value into that package with restrictions. That will fence off potentially your um, romantic weekends, that will actually segment certain customers off as well. Maybe it has to be booked 21 days in advance or it has to include a Saturday night. You have given them a rate that allows them to segment themselves. So when I go into hotels, the, this is the simplest rate strategy. This is four levels. I have some hotels that work with eight rate levels. So the very first steps is once we understand our business, once we understand our market and who we're actually trying to attract, let's have a look at your, what's called your transient rates, okay? We'll look at packages in a second. And I would say, get your lowest rate. The lowest rate that you will uh, ever sell on a wet Sunday in January. Distress, 
okay? Then get your highest rate, your RAC rate, something that you published to the tourist board, and get some rates in between. Now, this is the simplest one. It's four rate levels. As I said, it could be five, six, seven, eight rate levels. What's important here are the rates in between. In this example, your medium and high rates, because let's be honest, we don't necessarily want to have to sell at our low rates very often. We hope we're not in that situation of being you know, really distressed very often. And with the best will in the world, we're not gonna sell our rack that often either. So the rates in between are the rates that we have to really concentrate on, because those are the ones that are going to be out in the market most. In this example, you can see that the increments go up in 10 pounds. Make it easy for your reservation staff, not necessarily 10 pounds, it could be five pounds, it could be 15 pounds, it could be whatever it is. Make it easy for the, um, your reservation staff to know, well, if I'm, I was selling at 69, somebody's asked me to increase my price by one level, well then it's 79. Make your supplements for doubles, easy to remember, and your supplements, let's say, from your standard to your superior. If I phoned the Park Avenue Hotel or the Merchant tonight and asked them what they're selling at, they talk to me in colours. Okay, so if I phoned Jill in the Merchant tonight and said, Jill, what are you selling for the rest of the week? She'll say red, red, blue, purple, green, yellow, blue. I'll, I know that she's selling at 220, 220, 240, 260, 280, 240. That's what she's selling at. It also then helps that internally in hotels, and I know this is only a small thing, but if, if someone comes to reception or shouts in as, as happens, what are we selling at tonight? You'd say red. Customers don't know what red is, but you've already, you understand what your rate strategy is for that night. So we understand our business, we know who we're trying to aim at, and we set our prices. Have a look at your competitors, have a look at what your customers are willing to pay and then set your rates around that. So we've got our rates, what do we do with them now? Well, the most basic rule of revenue management is to protect the highest rates dur during days of high demand. Now, if I could give you an example. Um, again, I don't know this hotel's business um, particularly well, so I, I'll use this just as, as a case study. This hotel does well with weddings. So let's say today is February. For next July 2013, I would, let's assume that this hotel has nothing on the books for Saturday the 17th of August. Nothing on the books for Sunday the 18th of August. If I was the revenue manager here, I would know that even though I have nothing booked, I know on that Saturday I'm going to pick up a wedding. That's what happens. I have weddings in July and August. I may not have one already booked, but I will pick one up. I will also have leisure guests coming in. I know that the hotel is going to be very busy or full for Saturday the 17th of August. So if I'm going to be busy or full, should I be selling at rack? Well, the answer is no, I shouldn't be selling at rack because with the best one in the world, I'm not going to sell 80 bedrooms, 60 bedrooms at full rack price. So I need to get a price point. I need to get a point where I could start and then build on that. But because it's a Saturday, because I know I'm going to be busy and I know I'm going to have a wedding, I don't necessarily have to start at that yellow price. I don't need to start at distress or low. I could start at medium, because, oh, sorry. I could start at medium and build up on that. However, for the Sunday, I'm in the same scenario. I have nothing on the books for the Sunday evening. So what do I do? I know I'm not gonna sell at rack, so I'm actually going to start at distress. I'm gonna start at that very low rate because I may as well have some business on the books because even if I went out with the flag at the end of the drive and gave rooms away, I'm not gonna fill. So you have two different strategies for the Saturday versus the Sunday and it doesn't actually matter what business you have on the books. It's understanding your business when it's going to come in, when you can sell higher, and when you actually need to release those low rates into the market. When I go into hotels, I help them produce a forecast. And a forecast is not, as I've just said, they're um, setting the rates um, just because of the business they have on the books. We looked at, we, I would look at what happened last year and why, so this is the first step, all right? So why was I full 
that Saturday. I was full because I had a wedding. Have I got a wedding this year? No, not yet, but I know I'll have one. Um, the Tuesday and Thursday in September, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, I was full last year because I had a conference. Am I going to have that conference this year? No, I'm not. So I can't sell my rates really high. So understand what happened last year, why you filled, why you were empty. What business do you have on the books? Are you ahead of what you would normally be at this time or are you behind? Is there anything happening in the area? Any concerts or um, you know, hiking tours or anything? What else is happening in the area? And do you have ha any groups? Now, when I worked for Hilton, um, we used to set our rates. And for example, um, let's say uh, the Europa Hotel was uh, given the premier hotel for a conference, that there was a, a conference coming into town and Hastings Europa Hotel was the headquarter hotel. That actually um, may have had a negative effect on our business because we knew we were losing business potentially to the Europa, but actually it had a positive effect on our business because the Europa was blocked out with the delegates, we could pick up some of the conference business. So that's why it's really important to understand what's going in the area, on in the area and will it have a positive effect? Are you going to have lots of um, tour people coming in um, with all the events coming on in 2012? Is that going to generate new visitors for you? Or is it potentially if another hotel is named um, Headquarters Hotel, is it going to have a negative effect? Are they all going to move across the road? That then determines your base business. It will give you an idea of what you have on the books already what you potentially will do, whether you're a, um, behind or ahead of where you should be, and we'll give you an idea of what's going on in the city or the area. And this is a very simplified version of um, what a lot of my hotels actually work from. So I will do this um, 18 months, depending on the hotel, 18 months, two years in advance. So we will sit down and we'll put along here um, what we did last year. And it's important that you don't go by date, okay? So I'm not really interested on the, in the 8th of March, I'm interested in the closest Saturday, because Saturday will behave like a Saturday, a Sunday will behave like a Sunday. There's things that sit outside that, obviously, and as a revenue manager, I hate forecasting Easter, because it flipping moves around all the time. And Christmas as well, because Christmas Day, no matter what day it falls on, Christmas Day will always behave like Christmas Day. But have a look at the day last year, the day closest to the date, and I note what we did last year. Um, a, a line missing from this, literally because I didn't have room on the slide, was what business we, pretend we have on the books, what we're actually doing. And then I'll put a forecast in. I'm forecasting how many rooms I believe this hotel is going to do on any given day. And then I will set my rate strategy around that. Now, in real terms, the further out you are, the less changes you have. The closer you get to the time and the more the business is rolling and picking up, the more changes you will have and you will start to flex your prices within the last month, as we all know. That's when the things tend to get busier. Saying that, I work with one hotel. I'm lucky enough to work with Ashford Castle. And if Ashford, Ashford Castle gets nothing picked up in the last few days, if they don't have their business on the books secured three months in advance, they're all outside hanging themselves because the market comes from America and it books three months in advance. They get very little pick up close to the day. But I would say generally in this room, within the last month, you probably are getting most of your pick up. So that's when the rates would start to change and flex. That is the first step to achieving a basic forecast. And if you do nothing else when you go back, I would stress to you just to have a look at your business, who's coming in, what they do in your hotel, what rates you're selling at, and if possible, get rid of that high and low season. Um, people are used to rates flexing. They're used to being told, well, yes, sir, our rates are 80 pounds tonight, 100 pounds the following night. That's what they're used to. They're used to supply and demand within airlines and they're used to it with all the other branded hotels. The next step, um, and there's many steps, but this is step two, is to start looking at the numbers in a little more detail. So again, this is real data that I got from a hotel before I started working for them. So this is not my mistake, by the way. 
what we did was we tracked, um, well, we tracked all year, but there's six months. We tracked how Mondays normally behave in May. So we got the four Mondays, we averaged it out. So they were averaging out at, does that work? Oh, it does. So it averaged out, at, they were about 60% occupied on Mondays in May, 65 on Tuesday, 68. And we did that for the whole year. Okay, then we looked at their average rate. Okay. Um, again, we took the average rate on Mondays, averaged it out for the month, and these are the figures that we came up with. Okay. Now, you put those two figures together, and this is what I love as a revenue manager, because I love this data going in, because I know immediately that there's some glaring holes here and some glaring mistakes, and even by a little bit of tweaking, um, the hotel's going to see a return. So, for example, 100% full on Fridays at £58 average rate. I have, let's pick another day, Mondays in August, almost half the occupancy and nearly £20 more expensive. So that hotel had no rate strategy at all. Basically what they were doing was the reservation staff were getting, <coughs> taking the cheapest rates that they possibly could because they were easy to sell. Um, so going into a property like that, by tweaking the rates, you can make a big difference. If you do that in real terms, I then would normally color code this for hotel, well, actually just for myself, so I can see their hot dates. So as you can see, um, the hot dates when they're busiest, um, and every hotel is different on the thresholds that I use, but obviously Leisure Hotel, they're busy Fridays and Saturdays. They, that hasn't really come up, but it's kind of the ambery color is their middle dates and the blue dates are um, their cold dates when they're quiet. So if I, again, not knowing, potentially not knowing this hotel, if I was given that data immediately, I would say this was a business hotel and uh, potentially had a lot of business coming from the UK. We all know that the UK business dies in August because everyone takes their holidays. So Monday through Thursday, very quiet. So understand when you potentially have the opportunity to be busy, okay? Second consideration is it's not all about the rate. And if any of you come to the workshop um, that uh, you have to sit through, unfortunately, with me later, I'm going to talk about distribution and cost of sale um, and how much it actually costs you to get a booking into the hotel. But top line, so it's not just about the rate that you're getting in that £100 rate. Look at the profit. Um, so understand most hotels, oh, most hotels will have a 70% margin on their, again, this is an average on their bedrooms, 30% on their food, and potentially 90% uh, on their meeting space. So not all your revenue is created equally. I have um, one hotel, for example, that's brilliant at managing their revenue. They have certain packages that they close out on busy weekends because they don't make enough money. They look at their food, they look at their spa, they look at their golf, they look at all of those things and they actually net it right down and they understand that certain packages make them more money so they keep those packages open and they close the other packages because they don't make. And they fence people off so they get rid of those rates and force people to buy different packages that actually make them more money. This was a really interesting statistic for me and um, a learning curve even after all of these years. I was uh, very lucky to have lunch with a very good friend of mine who's one of, if not the authority um, in uh, hotels in Northern Ireland um, and he asked to remain nameless. But we had a chat over Christmas and he asked me roughly what I thought a four star hotel, what it cost to have a bedroom operating in a hotel, in a four-star hotel. In my naivety, I said about 20, 22 pounds. I was slightly wrong. We all know you have your laundry, you have your heating, uh, sorry, your lighting, your heating. You have Jennifer Lopez servicing your bedrooms, obviously. Uh, your toiletries. You have your offline um, advertising. But 
what about all the other costs in the hotel? If I go into a hotel and I am asked to look at their bars or their restaurants, that's really easy. You can have, you know very easily what the profit and loss is in a kitchen and a bedroom and a uh, bar. You know, you're looking at your net cost of sales, your gross, and you take your lighting and your heating in that department and your wage cost out and you get your profit. What about your profit? What about all those other people who have to be, uh, their costs have to be attributed to your property? So for example, your concierge and your reception, your human resources, uh, some of your, maybe your online marketing, your salespeople, your grumpy general manager. I actually typed into Google hotel general manager and his face came up. <laughs> Bless his heart, I don't know who he is. Should have used you, Terry. <laughs> All of your marketing. Would anybody like to put their head above the parapet? Um, and maybe you've heard this gentleman speak and know the answer. But would anybody like to guess how much a hotel costs? You're right, £43 a night. So for a four-star hotel in Northern Ireland, before you make one penny of profit, your net cost is £43. So again, I urge you to take all of those things into consideration when you're looking at rates. I know that you're not all four-star hotels, but go back and do the sums. I have spreadsheets to help then if you need it. Um, I put this in because I have, I work with one hotel and he'd love to be here because um, he's very proud of his hotel and, and he's quite happy with me naming him. The Clandy Boy Lodge Hotel in Bangor, I don't know if any of you know Pim, uh, but he's a very, very clever hotelier. His rooms are all the same size, but he sells as uh, standard and superior bedrooms. And he charges, from memory, I think 20 pounds more for a superior bedroom. In the good old days before the recession, um, it was very easy to sell those superior bedrooms and get the extra money for them, no problem. Um, however, at the minute, it's not always, and some of the price points dictate that he has to oversell in his standard bedrooms. For the 20 pounds, you get fruit, robe, washer, um, upgraded toiletries, an espresso coffee machine, and an iPod docking station. If he sells that room at a standard price, what does he do? He takes all of those things out of the bedroom. Why would he give someone paying a standard rate all of those things that actually cost him money? So he removes them. That person doesn't know. They paid a standard rate anyway. So in the good old days, when you used to get on a plane, do you remember the British Airways planes or British Midland, and depending on how many people were in first class, they moved the curtain up and down? If you can do that with your pricing, be more flexible, understand what your costs are if you have different types of rooms. And if you need to oversell on standard, for goodness sake, take all, take all the fluffiness out. Try to make that more flexible for you. Um, don't have time to talk about this in any great detail, but again, at your reservation process, you have the opportunity for upselling, cross-selling. Every small thing that you can add on at reservation process time will bring money straight to your bottom line, whether it's upgrading from standard to deluxe, whether it's adding on dinner or booking an activity or wine in the room or flowers in the room. If you're not investing in training the people who answer the phone, you all need shot. Sorry, I sound like Jeremy Clarkson, but you all need shot. Um, again, this, this part of it, this actually selling and converting, um, I normally deliver training on that that kind of takes a whole day. So just to put this slide in. We know our business, we've set our rates, we need to train our staff, and we also need to get the perception then out to the market. It is the customer's job to ask for a discount, not yours, to give it. Reference rates during low demand to rates charged in peak demand. Now again, this was an exercise that we did in a hotel not that long ago. We changed their rate strategy. And the girls were trained to say, um, yes, sir, we do have availability for tomorrow night. Our normal rate is 100 pounds. However, because I have some extra rooms available, I'm happy to offer you a rate of 80 pounds. What does that immediately do? It immediately stops someone going, is that the best rate? You've given him, that 100 pounds is your rack rate. It's your highest rate. You were never planning. You knew you were never going to fill at your highest rate. 
So reference it to the rate that you were actually planning to sell, maybe that green rate or the blue rate. So your, your normal rate, your rack rate is 100, but because I have availability, I am happy to offer you 80. However, I also have deluxe rooms available. They're 90 pounds and you get your da 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 You then have that opportunity to upsell as well. If challenged, advise that rates are sold out, not unavailable. Now, this isn't my study. I'm very lucky to have, over the last couple of years, completed um, all my revenue study online with Cornell University. Um, and I get their studies through every day. And this is their study. You don't ever say um, unavailable, apparently in your head. Sold out sounds better, and it, it works. If really pushed, offer an upgrade instead of dropping the rate. Make sure the clients know the restrictions of the rate you've purchased. And the last two, your last couple there, beware of the arguments to use when faced with a, a, any client, not necessarily a co corporate client, who's found a cheaper rate. We all know that we might have a corporate rate, let's say, at 90 pounds. And because we're sitting with no rooms booked for next Wednesday night, we're actually selling at 60. Um, so the corporate's on the phone, why are you selling at 60 and my corporate rate is blah. You have to, again, train your staff so that they can feel those arguments that, yes, sir, but your rate is £90, your rate is guaranteed, you can cancel on day of arrival, this is the rate that we've put into the market because we have additional rooms, it's a one-off, that rate could change within five minutes, your rate's guaranteed, blah, 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 we love you, come back. So, again, the, that's once you decide to change your rate strategy, you just don't change your rates and leave it and expect miracles to happen. You change your rate strategy and it's a change of culture in your business. And I hate that word, it sounds so airy-fairy, but it is, it changes the culture of how you do business. And again, this is not me. Um, whether you believe in revenue management or not, um, it works. Um, Cornell say that even those basic baby steps will deliver between four and 7% to your bottom line. I have to say I'm lucky enough never to have found that. Um, Clanty Boy Lodge within year one brought 17% to their bottom line just by changing their rates and that grows year on year as we get cleverer on how to do it. Um, so four to seven percent is the industry standard. So you know if any of you are thinking about it, know your business, look at your rates and hopefully try and put some changes in place. That's me, I'm done. <laughs>